Hi there, it's Professor Bernstein, and in this video, the second video in our series on John Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity, I'm going to delve a little more deeply into the text itself. One thing you want to keep in mind is that Winthrop is addressing a group of individuals who are journeying to what is essentially still the wilderness. And in order to create a colony, in order to successfully undertake what he describes as this extraordinary mission, they're going to have to reconceptualize their differences and they are going to have to um, sacrifice a great deal of individuality in order to focus on and foster the greater good of the community. So what he's doing here in a model of Christian charity is creating a model, a conceptual framework for helping them make this transition. So it's not just a literal physical transition that they're making from one place to another. They also have to make this inner intellectual, spiritual, religious transition. And that's what Winthrop is helping them do in this text. It makes a lot of sense that he uses the form of the sermon to make his points. You'll notice that a model of Christian charity is divided up into three sections. There's the first section that's really short, and it's where Winther basically says that God has always um, divided mankind into two groups, the rich and the poor, the, the, the powerful and the disempowered. Then he goes into a much longer section on the reasons for this. And then he, at the end, goes into the application where he really zooms into his specific listeners and their particular project. That's basically the same format that the Puritan ministers use to structure their sermons. But that's not really what makes uh, his use of the sermon interesting. What makes it interesting is that he places the issues and challenges that they're going to face while trying to set up this community within a compelling religious context. That is, he's providing them with a religious and spiritual model for understanding why they're going to have to give money to others, even if they might not get repaid. Um, and he's providing them with a blueprint for how to make these decisions. And he's even talking about the bonuses God's going to offer you, the rewards you're going to reap from giving. Uh, so on the surface, it seems like a lot of the issues that they're going to face are very practical and secular, meaning non-religious. But Winthrop is helping them see the religious and spiritual dimensions of these challenges so they'll be feel motivated to give, even in ways that they don't really want to give. Now, there's some other important issues that we need to address in relationship to a model of Christian charity. And those have to do with helping his listeners conceive of themselves as one, as part of one special body of com a body or community of seekers. Because these are people who might not have really known each other or been really connected with each other. But it's when you're trying to set up a colony, especially one in the wilderness, you're really going to need to come together as one. And you'll notice that Winter really primarily does this through his references to and his imagery the imagery he associates with love and the body. I'm just going to touch on one passage now, but there are a lot of other really important ones that you need to consider when reading. On page 82, he writes, For patterns, we have that first of our Savior, who out of his goodwill in obedience to his Father, becoming a part of this body and being knit with it in the bond of love, found such a native sensibleness of our infirmities and sorrows as he willingly yielded himself to death to ease the infirmities of the rest of his body and so healed their sorrows. So what he's saying here is that Christ is the originator of this pattern, this model, um, which Winthrop then relates to other Christians and then to his listeners themselves. He says that if they succeed in their mission, you know, they're in turn going to become a model for others. So you're starting to see this sort of layering of references to models, different types of models. He's creating a model for his listeners. Then he's talking about Christ as the originator of this um, particular model. And then they, in turn, have the potential to become models themselves. And this is very important because this is what, if people remember anything about a model of Christian charity, it's usually what I'm about to describe. Um, 
Towards the end of the text, Winthrop makes his famous declaration that if they succeed, God shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Now, that uh, the city on a hill, this image that has really stuck with people over time, that's that's obviously from the Bible. Um, and another thing I want to point out is that there is an element of threat. And that there's this threat as a form of motivation is very common in Puritan literature. Around the same time, he says, you know what? God will definitely break out in wrath against us if we fall to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions and seek great things for ourselves and our families and our future generations. Uh, so that's definitely another motivating tactic in there. But this it's this image of the colony as unique and special and as a model for others to follow that has really stuck in American rhetoric. Um, leaders like Ronald Reagan, John, John F. Kennedy have drawn upon this imagery not to talk about the colony, but to describe America, the United States. So that sort of brings us back to why is it that a model of Christian charity is in a, an anthology for American literature? It's a really good question. Um, first of all, there's not a lot of other literature or what we traditionally think of as literature to include if we want to start back in the 16... 30s, 1620s, 1630s, um, because there, there are two reasons for this. One, people were just really busy with the practical demands of setting up a new colony, didn't have a lot of time for these creative endeavors. But there's also um, the issue of the theological convictions, at least of the Puritans, because they didn't really think of themselves or they didn't feel comfortable appreciating human creativity. They were mainly focused on God as creator and his creative acts. And so they sort of spent their time trying to discern God's design and um, glorify it and make it visible. That was really where they felt comfortable in terms of expressing themselves is figuring out and sort of making God's glory shine, but not their own creativity. Um, but for our purposes, it's like, well, why should we keep reading this? And that's a, also a valuable question. And I think that because this, it, because of this powerful imagery in the sermon, that and in imagery, of course, is something we consider a hallmark of literature or something that is literary. This imagery of love and the body and the city on a hill has, um, been so powerful and sort of been so integrated so effectively into American rhetoric, into American, America's conception of itself, that it's still an important text to read. So that's it for now. Obviously, this is just a very introductory um, overview of Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity. If you're interested in getting access to a more detailed analysis of Winthrop's text, as well as a study guide, feel free to check out my website, which is jenniferbbernstein.com. Thanks. Bye.